kingdom here. And we admit that we don't know how to do that very easily. It's a challenging world, it's a challenging season. But you have given us your Holy Spirit to enable us to build your kingdom in this place. And so we pray that as we worship you together today, that we will experience your grace in such a way that we will know your inspiration as we go forward. Whatever we're doing in working on relationships with neighbors or seeking to uh, build a better community, we pray that in that process, by your grace, we will also build your kingdom here. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Glorify your name.
life. Thank you for the beauty of our earth. Thank you for the beauty of our earth. For our families. For family. Friends. Friends. And for being here with us today. And for being here with us today. And every moment of every day. And every moment of every day. We pray for all teachers, Lord. We pray for all teachers, Lord. That you will grant them wisdom and strength. That you will grant them wisdom and strength. To rise above all challenges. To rise above all challenges. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray.
ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not, do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. <coughs> but even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Thanks be to God. story of how to shake the bed, make the bed into bed to go with verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king, in his anger, had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly... Nebuchadnezzar jumped in his amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men, unbounded, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out! Come here! So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other god who can rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. You're going to have a mission moment this morning before we receive the Lord's offering, and Ashley is on deck. in the home 
which is now a healthy church. Mom recognized gospel sharing opportunities, so she kept her eyes open for more ovens. She learned to make soap using local ingredients like aloe, vera, milk, oats, and honey, and started soap making classes in five communities. In one rural area, the class led to a Bible study group of 15 to 20 adults. In the other areas, people made decisions to follow Christ or deepen their commitment to Him. The classes were so successful that the learners formed a co-op and developed a soap brand, Nectar. You see their soap there? They received an order from a hotel for 500 soaps and planned to start selling in supermarkets. The young woman who serves as president of the co-op was recently accepted into the Academy for Women Entrepreneurs, this program of the U.S. Embassy that was offered to 30 women in the province. Mouse writes of the president, she attended weekly classes in business practices and marketing for three months. At the end of the three months, the U.S. Embassy representative chose one business to provide more help and support, the SOAP Project One. Nectar will receive further training in contacts for marketing and distribution. The business now includes 12 women. So it's a picture of all the women working in the SOAP um, factory. And uh, they have a new facility now. And it says the classes surpassed Mouse expectations both economically and spiritually. Communities now see that she and her husband are not just standing in court corners preaching. We actually care about the people and are doing what we can to help, she said. And it all started with the strawberry pie. So I just thought this was really, this woman was just incredible how, you know, she just came as a missionary and she just kind of immersed herself in the community and just, you know, she wasn't even planning. It wasn't like, oh, this is a back door. And she's like, I'm just wanting to get to know these people. And, you know, now not only do these people have a viable business, but then just indirectly through her actions and stuff, people have come to the Lord, which I thought was really inspiring. I thought this woman was just incredible. So she wants to share that with you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ashley. Those who are going to receive the offering can come forward right now, if you wouldn't mind. See, our gifts to God's mission are not all about what we do here at St. Paul's, but they include things like supporting people who serve overseas, as the story actually shared. God's faithfulness to us never ends. We respond to God's faithfulness with our own gifts that can have an impact here in our own community as well as uh, in the broader area and around the whole world. So let's respond to God's faithfulness with our own faithfulness. Let's pray again. Father, receive our gifts and use them to make a difference. We can do little on our own. Together we can do so much more and we can support those who are building your kingdom in other places even as we seek to build your kingdom in this place. We worship you with our tithes and our offerings in gratitude for your saving grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord's offering will be received and we will sing Who You Say I Am.
pray together. Father, we confess that at times as we take in the news and try to understand life in our time, we are confused. Many voices confuse us and we see a world where right and wrong are blurred. We need your grace and your word to show us the way to go. We need to hear from you time and again that we are who you say we are, beloved, chosen. Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Draw us to your word daily that we may receive both affirmation and challenge, not being stagnant in our journey with you. We pray for those who serve you faithfully. We remember missionaries like the ones Ashley spoke about who labor for your kingdom overseas in ways that Enable them to share your good news in an undefensive way, that just through the simple making of soap and pies, that people can indeed witness for Jesus Christ. We uphold our mission partners around the world who serve you with joy, sometimes in the midst of much sorrow and persecution. Minister to them in their point of need, we pray by your Holy Spirit, and help them to know that they are prayed for and encouraged, even if we can't speak with them face to face. We pray for those who are in need of your healing touch. We remember Bob, Karen's dad, who is recovering from his hip surgery. Free him from pain. Show yourself to him in a deep way, and be near to Jackie and Karen and Chris and their whole family. We pray for Tracy, that you will be with her in her recovery from a heart attack. We also remember Paul, and Ida, and Morris, and Rhea, and Janet, and Harold, and Carl, and all we know who are dealing with health concerns in these days. We pray for the people affected by the shooting down of that airplane in Iran, some of whom are in our own community. Bring comfort to those who grieve and help them to find ways to bring closure amid this tragedy. We rejoice in the rain falling in Australia these days and pray for those whose lives have been affected by this difficult time. Thank you for the firefighters from around the world who have worked tirelessly to try to bring these fires under control. And thank you for bringing rain to the affected area. We pray for leaders in churches everywhere where the gospel is preached, including right here. Endow them all with wisdom and power as they seek to fulfill your vision for your church in each community where your truth is upheld. And as we turn to your word, Father, may the words of our mouths, the meditations of all our hearts, and the thoughts of our minds be centered on you. Quicken us to be ready to receive from you today, so that we may be transformed by what you say to us by your Holy Spirit, going forth to build your kingdom for the glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, when we think about idolatry, often what comes to mind is something very Old Testament-ish. Uh, consider when Moses was off talking to the Lord, uh, he uh, left Aaron in charge, and what did the people do under Aaron's leadership? They took some gold and created a cow and started to worship the stupid thing. That's the kind of thing we think about when we think about idolatry. But today, idolatry can be much more nuanced than that. Let me suggest to you that one of the idols that we deal with in contemporary culture is the idol of identity. How we choose to identify ourselves never used to be a big deal, or so we think. But today, how we choose to identify ourselves in a culture of a multiplicity of sexual preferences and hyphenated nationalities is a real issue. We can't control how people who don't follow Jesus choose to identify themselves. We can only lead by example and hope 
that uh, they may follow the hope that is ours in Jesus. And that's why it's important for us to know who we are by knowing whose we are. Let that sink in for a second. It's important for us to know who we are by knowing whose we are. When we are adopted into God's family as his children by faith, sisters and brothers with Jesus and with each other, that trumps every other identifier that we might choose with which to label ourselves. For example, I am not first a white heterosexual Canadian married male. I am first a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if you follow Jesus, the same is true for you. You are first a disciple of Jesus Christ. But the question then is begged, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a disciple? Well, literally, a disciple is someone who is a learner, somebody who sits at the feet of a teacher. And uh, we get to do that when we read the scriptures, when we sing God's praises, when we hear the Bible taught. We are sitting at the feet of Jesus as his disciples. And that should be true whether we are in church or whether we're hanging with friends or at work, whatever it is that we may be doing at any particular time, we are still disciples of Jesus wherever we go and whatever we do. Everything else is both secondary to that and influenced by it. But how do we define a disciple beyond that? This is the question we seek to answer today, how the Bible defines a disciple. And Jesus has an answer for that in John chapter 17. We've come a long way in the Gospel of John, haven't we? <laughs> uh, in the fall, we finished chapter 16, and a couple of years ago, during Lent, we looked at chapters 18 and 19. So all we have left now in our conquering of the Gospel of John is 17, 20, and 21. And I love chapter 17. It is my favorite chapter in the whole gospel, even more than God so loved the world, as important and wonderful as that is. John 17, I love it because it shows us the heart of the Lord Jesus. Up to this point, he's taught the way of the kingdom, he's healed, he's raised the dead, he's called people to repentance and faith, and now with his crucifixion imminent, he offers a prayer to the Father that helps us understand the whole gospel as well as what Jesus longs for his disciples. Those he lived with day in and day out, and people like us who are his disciples today. This prayer might be seen as the equivalent of the prayer in Gethsemane that's found in the other three gospels, though it is of a, honestly a different nature in many ways. It comes to us in three parts. We're actually going to divide it in two, just to be contrarian. Uh, first part is Jesus' prayer for himself. The second part is Jesus' prayer for his disciples who were with him. And the third part is Jesus' prayer for all those who would eventually become his disciples. And today, we're going to look at his prayer for himself and the first part of his prayer for his disciples, because there's so much that can encourage us there. So let's look at John chapter 17, verses 1 to 12. After saying all these things, all what things? How, how far back does our memory go? Well, he's really, John is referring to the, the farewell discourse in chapters 14, 15, and 16. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven, common Jewish prayer posture, probably arms extended, and said, Father, the hour has come. Think about that. Jesus had a calendar. It didn't look maybe the same as ours, but he had a calendar. It didn't have days and weeks and months, but it was a calendar based on his mission from the Father. Back in chapter <coughs> 2, at the wedding feast at Cana, Jesus was asked to do certain things, and he said, My hour has not yet come. Now here in chapter 17, he prays to the Father and he says, Now's the time. The hour has come. Glorify your Son so he can give glory back to you. This is the climax of the incarnation, the cross. Jesus 
sees the cross as glory, as homage to the Father. It is a place of honor for him, even though no others would see it that way at the time. Diana was listening to a sermon by Andy Stanley last week, and he, he offered this quotation, which I thought was salient. He said, the hour at which God was most glorified is the hour at which we would be most horrified. Isn't that true? God is most glorified on the cross of Jesus Christ. And we look at the cross in horror. Verse 2. That's a lot for verse 1, isn't it? Verse 2. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the one true God, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. Now, I'm going to pause just again for a second here. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Jesus is the only way to the Father. If you want to gain eternal life, you need to be in relationship with Jesus. There is no other way. Verse 4. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Although that final act, the cross, was yet to come. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. Jesus is asking the Father to bring him back near to the Father's heart, as John described uh, in chapter 1, verse 18. And this is referring to the eternal nature of God the Son, right? Jesus is saying, Father, I want to be back with you. I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. Don't miss that. That's really good news, right? They were always yours. You cannot lose your salvation when you truly say yes to Jesus. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. Of course, they probably didn't really understand that at the time. For I have passed on to them the message you gave to me. They accepted it and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. It's not that the world is beyond God's love. That's a topic for another day. But just understand that he's, there is a certain sectarian nature about this prayer, which we're going to explore a little bit more next week. But he says, all who are mine belong to you. Why? Because Jesus and the Father are one. And you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Now I am departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them. That word protect means to obey or observe the way we might protect the Ten Commandments by observing them, by keeping them. Jesus asks that the Father protect us by keeping us in his care amid persecution, because that persecution is inevitable, right? So, now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. Not a legislated unity, but a natural, organic unity, just as the Father and the Son have a natural unity. During my time here, I have protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost, except the one headed for destruction, as the scriptures foretold. Of course, the one headed for destruction is assumed to be Judas Iscariot, right? Um, that term is used only one other time in the Holy Testament. It's in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, in reference to the Antichrist. But in, in Jewish parlance, it was a term that referred to somebody who had abandoned all character, somebody who was doomed to destruction. Now, did you see in that passage how Jesus defined the disciples in his prayer? We're going to look at, look at that a little more closely, and if you want to follow along, there are some blanks in your notes for this. First, Jesus defines disciples as those who belong to the Father. Disciples are those who belong to the Father. Verse 6, he says, I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. Jesus revealed the Father's heart to the first disciples he called, and through his word, he reveals the Father's heart to us. And notice, too, Jesus says that his disciples were always the fathers. 
Those who follow Jesus can take heart in the fact that they have been chosen from eternity. Now, some will choose to argue that it is we who have the right to choose to follow Jesus, and of course that's true. But the fact is, we could only do that if God had already given us grace to believe, right? Most people would understand that if you hear the gospel, the bare, true, plain gospel, any average person may find that very hard to believe unless God has already given that person the grace to do so. It's one of the tensions the Bible offers with which we must learn to live, I guess. Just because disciples are chosen in eternity doesn't mean, though, that we shouldn't share our faith with our neighbors or proclaim the, proclaim the gospel from pulpits everywhere. It, it is through those means that the Lord awakens in his people the call that he places on their lives to be disciples of Jesus. Lots of us have times when doubt creeps in. We wonder if this decision to follow Jesus was really the right one, especially when culture crowds in on us so much in this day. But we can take comfort amid our struggles that the Lord has us tightly in his grip. Tightly in his grip. And no matter how often we might feel like letting go, he is not going to let go of us. Be encouraged by that. Disciples belong to the Father. And second, disciples keep God's word. Disciples keep God's word. Verse 6 also says, You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Of course, the first disciples of Jesus were keeping the word as it was expressed in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, and they kept Jesus' word, too, by following what he obeyed, as it was taught as a practical application of Old Testament principles. Now, today, we also have the benefit of having the whole Bible. The Old Testament and the New Testament, which was... Uh, compiled by faithful followers of Jesus to help disciples of all times to live for Jesus. Of course, if we're going to keep the word, we have to read it and learn it. That can involve memorization, uh, and many people find that very difficult, right? Uh, both hard and valuable at the same time. Uh, by memorizing portions of scripture, though, you can build your faith in challenging times, and you can encourage others. If you are lying on a gurney in a hospital hallway and have had just some sort of illness that has befallen you, you may not have your Bible in your hip pocket because you wouldn't have a hip pocket in a hospital gown. <laughs> but you might have some Bible up here, and that way you can be comforted by what you have memorized. Uh, this, by the way, doesn't mean we should toss out scripture verses like little bombs, right? In, in this age of social media, we're never quite sure how to handle some of these things because there's so much tension and so much uh, drama in, in social media. But sometimes people will just kind of sit there in the middle of an argument and they'll log out a Bible verse. No context for it, no nothing. And it's, it's kind, of like, kind of like a shrapnel wound you're trying to inflict or something like this. Uh, we shouldn't do that without context to help people understand what God means in his word. But it does mean, too, that we should use the Bible in ways that will edify and encourage both ourselves and others. So to that end, understand that you will not get enough Bible just by coming here on Sunday morning. What you're getting in this time, I hope, is helpful, but it isn't enough for us. We need to be doing our scripture engagement in other ways at other times. For example, reading the Bible at home in your personal devotions or your family devotional time. You can listen to the Bible, whether on CD or through the Version app, which uh, if you don't have that on your smartphone, doesn't matter which format you use, just uh, go to your app store or play store and type Version, and you can download this, it's outstanding. In fact, insider secret. I'm meeting with a colleague in early February who uh, is very computer uh, tech savvy, and he is going to talk to me about how we could have our own app 
or St. Paul's. So you would be able to go to your phone or whatever device you keep, download this app, and there would be all kinds of helpful information and maybe ways to give and all sorts of things on there. So uh, stay tuned for that. That's uh, yet to come. So you can, you can download the version, read the Bible, listen. You can listen through the version. There's all kinds of ways. If you're on the GO train or if you're in your vehicle, just find ways to listen or read. You can also listen to great preachers on podcasts. You can make use of Right Now Media, which is a, a, a subscription service that we pay for for the whole church, where you can stream videos that will uh, help you with Bible teaching and application, stuff for kids, all sorts of things there. And you can join a Life Connect group. That's also an important part of getting more Bible into you. Uh, we go deeper in the Sunday message in two of the three groups that we currently have. Uh, questions based on what we're learning here uh, that we can just ask in a very comfortable environment. Uh, we got a group Tuesday morning, meets in Paul Gray for ladies, it does that. There's a group that meets uh, on Thursday morning for men. Uh, they're not studying the, the, the sermon questions, but uh, they're, they're doing something edifying, I'm quite sure. And uh, Wednesday night, there's a group for anybody meeting in Chamber that is uh, going to study the questions based on the message too. So lots of opportunities. And if for some reason none of those opportunities works for you, but you want to get into a Life Connect group, note that on your connection card, and I will uh, find ways to get another group going. An hour and a half out of your week to develop your walk with God, pretty good investment. I recommend you join a group. It's one thing to know God's word and another thing to keep it. That's what this treasuring, obeying, following God's word is about. But two, we can know the Bible inside out. But if we don't know the Bible, that's a very hollow thing. We're not really disciples of Jesus. If we memorize scripture, but don't know the Lord of the scripture. You have to start somewhere. So start by reading a little bit of Bible every day. Uh, listening to it whenever you're commuting or whatever. Start with the Gospel of John, and when you're finished the Gospel of John, go back and read the whole New Testament. And when you're done with that, go back to the beginning and take your time working through the whole Bible. It'll, it'll all start to make sense if you follow that method. And inevitably, you will have questions based on all that you're reading. We have a very well-stocked church library that can help you with that. I have a very well-stocked library that can help you with that. And if you've got a question, just send me an email and say, Jeff, I'm wondering about that, 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 and we can find an answer and talk about it. So disciples belong to the Father, they keep God's word, and third, disciples glorify Jesus. Verse 10 says, you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. And we think, that's a church word. What does that mean? What does it mean? It means to give honor, to give praise. <laughs> Literally, the word glory means heavy. So glorifying God means that we are taking God very seriously. Now, that does not mean God does not have a sense of humor. I sure hope he does, or I'm going to hear on Judgment Day about some of my table graces.
This is something God does. Verse 11 says, Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name. This is not about what we do. This is about what God does. Ultimately, the Christian faith is all about what has been done for us through Jesus' atoning death and victorious resurrection. Disciples act in obedience to this. But there's a promise that we have from the Lord Jesus that in the midst of all that, the Father will protect us. Just as we keep God's word, God keeps us. He protects us. He maintains his relationship with us. We are never outside of his grid. When we're facing trials and persecution simply because we follow Jesus, the Lord protects us amid those trials and persecution. And remember this. He doesn't always keep us from those things, but he keeps us amid those things. That's why Nancy and I read the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shake the bed, make the bed, and to bed you go. That's how I remember it. Those are those characters from the book of Daniel who were so faithful to the Lord, they were not kept from Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace. But the Lord was present with them in Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace. It must have been a scary place, but the Lord was in there with them, and when they came out, no part of them was singed at all. We will still have our fiery furnace moments. But the Lord will be present with us, protecting us whatever the trial may be. I have gone through trials as I know you have, and I have always, always found the Lord to be faithful. He's protected me. Maybe it didn't always feel like fun at, and games at the time, but I came through on the other side deeper in my faith, stronger in my resolve to serve the Lord. God will not always save you from your trials but he will protect you in their midst. And let's be honest, sometimes God's protection doesn't look like we think it should. Some followers of Jesus have died amid their trials. Does that mean God didn't protect them? No, it means he had a better plan for them. We may not understand that better plan. And we can't always assume that he will preserve our lives, though more often than not, he does. But we can trust we can let him protect us in our trials rather than trying to avoid our trials altogether because we fear God will not protect us. He will. Disciples are protected by the Father. So faithful disciples of Jesus, learners at his feet, belong to the Father. They keep God's word. They glorify Jesus, are protected by the Father. And finally, we'll spend more time on this next week too, disciples are one. Verse 11 says, so that they will be united just as we are. Now, unity in the church today seems pretty hard to come by. When you combine the constant availability of information, right and wrong on the internet, with a culture that despises authority, it can be challenging for disciples of Jesus to maintain unity. There are differences in how we govern the church, how we do baptism in the Lord's Supper, what kind of music we sing even social issues, but despite those differences, our common commitment to the Lordship of Jesus and the authority of his word should be our overriding goal. Of course, if we're committed to Jesus' Lordship, the authority of the scriptures, that'll influence what we believe on any number of topics. Some of those topics can be overlooked in the name of unity, while some others are more challenging. Remember what I said at the beginning about the idol of identity? Even that should be knocked down in the name of the Lordship of Christ and the authority of his word. I'll say more about this next week, but suffice it to say for now, the followers of Jesus should try to set aside as many differences as possible in order to focus on the great commission Jesus has given us to make disciples of all nations. Anything that keeps us from that goal, from that mission, that commission should be seen as an idol, and the Lord wants us to have no idols, no other gods before him. The church in the Western world is divided, and we see society becoming more secular. 
But in the global south and the far east, the church is far more unified in its approach, and people are coming to faith in Christ by the thousands every day. Maybe we can learn something from that. I hope you find this encouraged. As a disciple of Jesus, you belong to the Father. You're called to keep God's word. You're called to glorify Jesus. You're protected by the Father. You're called to unity. How can you respond to that? Well, that's where the connection card comes in. You can easily remove that from your bulletin due to the fine perforation that is there. You can fill out the front. It's a way for me to be able to respond to you when you respond. No spam, you know the usual routine. And on the back, there are some opportunities that you might consider. For instance, I will read the Bible daily to know and keep God's word. If you'll read the scriptures and listen, maybe listen, do what I suggested earlier to engage yourself in God's word through the many resources available to you, check that off and grow as a disciple of Jesus. It doesn't have to be five chapters a day, right? It can be as simple as two or three verses if that's what the Lord grabs you by the scruff of the neck with. That's okay. Just reading the Word of God. You could say, I will bring glory to Jesus by the way I live out God's Word. By studying the Bible, we learn how to live in the way of Jesus, and that brings Him glory. How do I live as a disciple of Jesus, as a Christian? Read the Scriptures and find out. People who may never pick up a Bible will look at you and me as followers of Jesus, and we may be the only Bible they ever read. Make sure it's an accurate version. So if you'll put your faith to work through the study of the scriptures in any number of the ways suggested, check that out. You can say, I will seek the unity of the church. Now that doesn't mean we engage in the Neville Chamberlain School of Unity, right? Second World War, he was a peace at any price kind of guy. And if he'd stayed in charge, the world would be a very different place today. No. It does mean, though, offering grace and seeking reconciliation where there are differences between people who are seeking to be disciples of Jesus, all in the name of being one in reaching a lost world with the life-changing and eternity-changing power of the good news of Jesus. So if you will seek the kind of unity that makes more disciples, then check that out. Now, if, you're, if the description of a disciple suggests to you that you're not yet a disciple of Jesus, then I want you to check off, I want to become a disciple of Jesus, tell me more. And I will follow up with you and give you some resources and tools that will help you grow in your faith and be a disciple of Jesus who belongs to the Father, who keeps God's word, who glorifies Jesus, who is protected by the Father, who seeks the unity of the church. And if you're a disciple, you'll want to keep the Great Commission to go and make, all, to make disciples of all nations by sharing your faith with others, building those relationships that allow you the opportunity to invite people into community with other disciples of Jesus. So you can check off, I will invite a friend to St. Paul. Together, we can make a difference that will build God's kingdom, changing our world for God's glory, so that it more closely reflects his vision of for what he wants it to be. There's an old saying, whose roots may be Jewish but are not clearly understood, but it really applies to people like us who seek to follow Jesus faithfully in our time. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Jesus is our rabbi, our teacher, and we should follow him so closely that the dust that's kicked up from his sandals covers us. That's how closely we're invited to follow him. <clears throat> so as you seek to be a disciple by the definition Jesus himself gave in this prayer to the Father, may it be true for you and for me that we will be covered in the dust of our Lord Jesus, we seek to be your disciples, but we know we can't do this on our own. We need your Holy Spirit living in and through us to give us grace to be obedient, to follow you so closely that we are caked in your dust. Help us when we stumble and fall 
when we doubt and question, and when we're just plain tired to be the disciples you have chosen us to be, kept safe by the Father amid whatever may happen. We ask this in your most powerful name. Amen. We're going to close with the gospel song, Now I Belong to Jesus. Please stand. Jesus Christ. May his love surround you, his grace attend you, and his spirit fill you as you go to make disciples of all nations. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us and those we love today and always.